Okay, the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 2. Chapter 2. Acts, chapter 2. Get your Bibles. Don't have a Bible, get a Bible. If you have a Bible, don't forget your Bible. Bring it to church with you so you can follow along. The book of Acts. Amen. If I could get to it. There we go. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 37. Acts chapter 2 verse 37. We'll read through verse 41. And uh, I want to teach, preach on soul winning and repentance. Soul winning and repentance. Miss Sarah, um, is this door out here short up? Thank you. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Let's begin to read. The Bible says, um, now when they heard these thi- uh, now when they heard this, you say, what's, what's this? Uh, Peter has basically, um, through this whole chapter, really begin to talk about Jesus, who he was, talked about uh, David and foretold of him coming and the resurrection and, 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 and uh, basically flayed them with the gospel and with truth. He says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and your children uh, and to all that are afar off, even as uh, many as the Lord your God shall call. And with many words, uh, many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Uh, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about three thousand souls. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd help us tonight, help us to understand uh, the truth of the Bible, know the gospel clearly, uh, to have a clear message so we can develop a clear method to go out and preach that message and win mankind to Jesus. Uh, Lord, bless our church, help our church in all that we venture to do, all that you know that is on our heart. And uh, Lord, we, we're, um, uh, you, Lord, you know the heart of our church. Lord, I'd ask that you'd help it, answer our prayers, uh, give us strength. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to make um, I want to give you a, a couple of examples of this repentance. Uh, Strong's concordance. The word repentance is defined as a compunction. It's saying uneasiness of conscience. Now I want you to listen. Hey, you listen. You listen. Because when I was your age, the battle of repentance was being fought. It was still being fought. Um, hashed out real well, but there was still a great remnant who took repentance out of context, and we're teaching others also. And there are still people who take the word repentance and they use it in the wrong way. Well, if you guys get it early and you guys know young, you guys can be um, uh, equipped as good soldiers to win many to Christ. Okay, so according to Strong's Concordance, uh, the word repentance is defined as a compunction or an uneasiness of conscience or feelings uh, for guilt including reformation by the reversal of decision. Uh, Strong's also states, to repent is to think differently or afterwards to consider. Vine's Dictionary of New Testament words, and I have one of these, um, and an Old Testament also, uh, among many other, I have Strong's also. Uh, Vine's Dictionary of the New Testament, uh, uh, New Testament words, gives the definition of repent as to perceive afterwards, So get this, to perceive or understand afterwards, signifying the changing of one's mind or purpose. Repentance is defined as afterthought or change of mind. Webster's New World Dictionary gives the following uh, definition for repent. Uh, To feel such regret over some past action, intention, etc. As to change one's mind. Uh, Let's see, what's the next one? Uh, The American College Dictionary defines the word as follows. To feel such sorrow for sin or fault as to be disposed to change one's life for the better. 
So let's, let's look at these in comparison. Strong's implies that repentance involves reformation. Vine's doesn't. Vine's is the opposite. Strong says um, uh, repent. Repentance has reformation. Vine's says opposite. Webster's New World Dictionary says that repentance is the changing of your mind. The American College Dictionary says that repentance involves changing your life. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, that's just four examples. There are many, many, many other definitions. We could go on and on, citing source after source after source. And to be honest with you, that would just be redundant, and it wouldn't really serve a, a wholesome purpose besides to give you knowledge that, well, does anybody know what they're talking about? <laughs> Who's right? Strong, buying, Webster's, American College? Who? Okay, well, the thing I like about the Bible, that I love about the Bible, is the Bible, you, always, you compare the Bible with Bible. You compare Scripture with Scripture. The Bible will teach you. God didn't go, oh, I'm going to give this Bible to the English-speaking people, but they're really not going to know what it's all about until they got a Strong's, until they have a Vines or a Webster's. Nope, not so. God laid it out. It is full. It is complete. And anyone who has a heart that's seeking after salvation can find it. Now, uh, There's a lot of confusion, even amongst people who hold dear to one side. They're like, what if the other side's right? You know, um, uh, it, and, and, and if, we, if we just hammered away on the repentance issue of the word and its definition only, it would lead to more confusion. It, become, it, it would add to people becoming more ardent about what they believed instead of saying, let's go to the Bible. Let's go to the Bible. What does the Bible have to say about repentance? Um, so the conclusion of this whole matter can be drawn from um, apparent di uh, differences in definition. Uh, first, first, we could uh, conclude that the issue of repentance has been around for quite some time. Like I said, it was around while I was a kid and before I was a kid. Uh, it was around for quite some time. Uh, you also could conclude that uh, the, there are areas in our lives where rep repentance does only involve the change of my mind. That, that is true. It does. It, 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 does, uh, uh, it does have a, a place in my life where repentance deals with the change of my mind. We used to say uh, that song, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. Okay, but you can't, you can't really see the changes in your health until you, start, until you repent of the things that are hurting your health and then turn to the things that will help your health. So there is repentance that's needed. And there are other areas uh, of where repentance involves the changing of our life, uh, of course, for the better. So the real issue here is not the word repentance. It's not a word issue. It's a Bible issue. This isn't an argument about a word. It's, a, it's an argument about a Bible doctrine. What does the Bible have to say about repentance? What does the Bible say on the subject of repentance? And what can we take away from it? And not only can we take away from it, uh, but what does it specifically have to do with salvation? What does repentance have to do with salvation? Because we know repentance, uh, from their root words, we know that means uh, um, metanoia means change your mind, and there's metamorphosis, which means change your ways, a changing of your being. That's what metamorphosis. You ever hear that word, metamorphosis? A change. It's a um, the uh, caterpillar to a butterfly. It metamorphu, metamorphosis. It's the same thing with metanoia. Noia is the mind. Meta change. Change your mind. Change your mind. So we know that those apply, but which one applies? To salvation, how does it apply? Where? Do, so, how do we uh, um, how do we apply it? So, um, before I think we won't finish it tonight. I think maybe this is a, a two week, possibly a three week situation here about salvation and repentance and how we can become um, a solidified and once saved, always saved, and how we can be solidified as um, uh, confident, confident soul winners. Uh, confident soul winners. So, number one is what causes a man to repent. 
What causes a man to repent? Now, the Bible is incredibly clear on what causes a man to repent. And the, uh, the answer is found in uh, 2 Timothy 2.25, where it says, In meekness, I just quoted this uh, not long ago on a Saturday, In meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. What causes a man to repentance? Repentance to what? To the acknowledging of the truth. What causes a man to repent? His acknowledging the truth. Understand, according to, uh, according to this verse, it's repentance or the changing of your mind comes as a result of acknowledging the truth. People that have been persuaded um, from, uh, uh, if you get a, a good um, suicide, uh, a suicide prevention, um, what do they call them, um, a negotiator, where they get up there and they speak to this person. What'd they just do? They got that, they talked to that person, they said enough of the right things to get that person to change their mind. They had to come to the, they acknowledged that jumping off the building, that pulling the trigger, that cutting their wrists, that popping the pills, that, that uh, the noose around the neck, that that was a bad idea. It, don't do that, that's a bad idea. Whatever has led you here is that it, you got something or someone or the, the, uh, your voice is inside, your heart, it's, it's lying to you. Acknowledge the truth that there are people that love you. Acknowledge the truth that there are people out here that, that see value in your life and there's help out here for you and, and you can have a good life. And so a good um, a suicide negotiator gets that person off the ledge. They talk them off the ledge. They say enough of the right things to convince that person to the truth of living. Well, it's the same thing with, with, with salvation and repentance. When we go out soul winning, when we speak to somebody and they say, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that, God has given them, peradventure has given them the ability to repent. God gave them the repentance to acknowledge the truth, acknowledge the truth, change their mind. So what is truth? What truth is it that they are acknowledging? What truth? The word of God. You see, we don't preach these, we didn't pull these tracks out of some other book. We pulled the, all this is, is a mini version of the word of God. It's so all this is. This right here are the words of God that we've put a collection together to, that the word of God already put together, that we go around and say, slip that in everybody's door and windshield. We can't put a whole Bible under there, but bless God, we can take the words of God and we can tuck it in their door and we can go to Walmart, amen, and we can go to Target and we can go to these stores and tuck it in pockets and put it in books. I like going to, um, uh, what's the place that we have, a Barnes & Noble? or a, it's a Barnes & Noble, going to bookstores, and if I have trackets, uh, trackets, tracks on me, I'll, man, I'll find books and put them in books, go to the book of um, uh, what, some sort of a satanic book and put that bad boy in there, watch it catch on fire, amen, uh, uh, find a Ouija board and tuck that up in there. You say, what? Why not, folks? You live once. I mean, why not? I would. How, how incredible would that be for somebody, some some uh, wannabe Wiccan or some Satan worshiper, somebody goes and buys some one of these um, a, a Harry Potter book, you know, you put it in a Harry Potter book uh, or the the um, Lord of the Rings or something, I don't know. But you tuck those in somewhere, you know, and uh, uh, they open it up, and man, a gospel track falls out. I'd love to see that reaction. <laughs> I'd love to see the reaction as a human just to get the kicks out of it, you know. But who knows that there's some. Uh, uh, some kid, some young man, some young woman who's been influenced by the peers around them, and they're just getting involved in this 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 uh, witchcraft and this Satan worshiping and this 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 wicked dark stuff, and they open up a book or they open up a pamphlet or they open something out, and one of these falls out, and they take it as a sign. Amen. Now I don't know who's going to buy that book. I don't know who's going to buy that magazine or that game. I don't know who's going to buy it, but I know it, it's going to end up somewhere. And somebody's going to go through the pocket. Somebody's going to go through the pages. Somebody's going to open it up, and that's going to fall out. They're going to do one of two things. They're going to reject it, or they're going to accept it. It's not up, I don't, I, I, it's not up to me for, to who accepts it and who rejects it, but they have one decision to make with it, and it's the repentance that God will grant them to repent to the truth. What is the truth? The word of God, what, the word of God. So what makes a man repent? The acknowledging of the truth. Acknowledging of the truth. 
Number two, what makes a person lost? What makes a person lost? Uh, in order to get the right perspective uh, on the subject of repentance and salvation, I want to give you a couple questions first. And you don't have to answer them. They're, um, um, what's the word? Rhetorical. I was going to say redundant. They're not redundant, I promise. They are, the, they are rhetorical. Uh, uh, the first question is this. What makes a person lost? What makes a person lost? Now hang on and listen to this. What's the difference between saved people and lost people? What makes a lost person lost? So once we determine what, a lost per what makes a lost person lost and we change it, that person's no longer saved or lost but saved. So once we determine what a lost person is and we changed it, they can, they're now saved. So in order to be saved, we must repent of whatever makes us lost. It's very, uh, very simple. The Bible says in John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So according to this verse in John 3, 18, what condemns a man? Luke, do you, do you know? What condemns a man? Not believing. not believing on, yep, that's right. Not believing on the only begotten Son of God. So the Bible says, he that believeth not is condemned already. Not you will be condemned. You are now condemned. You are condemned now. Since then, a man is condemned or lost. Uh, uh, he's on his way to hell. Why? Because he doesn't believe. He doesn't believe. So number one is what causes a man to repent? The word of God does. Acknowledging the truth. The truth is the word of God. Number two, what makes a person lost? They don't believe. They don't believe. Of course, some of you are like, yeah, we, we know this is ABC one, two, three for us. But it's good to have a refresher, hit that, re uh, 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 that reset button. And kind of the things that riled me up about this is a lot of the things that we, we did in Sunday school over the last month was um, uh, our world has been heavily influenced by false doctrine. Uh, uh, American gospel is all about prosperity and no sickness and all wealth and, and no pain and just living a really happy life. And if you're not living it, you didn't really repent. And if you don't have all these things, you don't really know God. Uh, and when you come run into these people out there, and listen, you're going to run into people who right, right in the moment that you meet them, they think they're saved. They think they're on their way to heaven. They think they have it together. And they're going to tell you, yes, I'm a believer. But they're really not. So it is imperative that we are equipped with the gospel and we know it inside and out, forward and backward, up and down. So what makes a person lost? He doesn't believe. So if not believing makes a person lost, well, what makes a person saved? So if a man is condemned because he believeth not, then what must he do to be saved? What must we do then? What do we have to do? And he asked Paul and Silas and, and the, the Philippian judge, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He must change what made him lost. It's very simple. What makes you lost? Not believing. Well, what then will make you saved? Believing. Believing makes you saved. What, what does he have to do? Let's use that R word. He must repent. He must repent. Repent from what? Re repent. Okay, if I have to repent, what do I repent from scripture says repent repent from not believing to belief you don't just repent of not believing and just like okay I, I i don't not believe okay but if you don't not believe what do you believe in what do you have to believe in what do you believe in so if not believing makes him lost and that's changing his mind from not believing to believing it makes him saved so if a man is to be saved, he must repent from what made him lost. And what makes him lost? Not believing. Say it with me. Not believing. What makes him lost? Not believing. What makes him saved? Believing. So once again, it makes a person lost by not believing. It is believing that makes him saved. The Bible says the uh, and uh, the, the last part of John 3, 18, it gives an answer for this whole situation. Why is he saved? Why, why, is, why is he under condemn, condemnation? Because 
Because, because, here's the reason, Luke. This guy is under condemnation. He that believeth not on the only begotten Son of God is condemned. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, I wish I, get a, I wish I could get our tracks to yell at people in a good way, like shout for their attention. Hey, look here. I wish I, we could, just had the right phrase and the right, um, the right um, uh, uh, heading on the track to be able to grab people's attention. And every verse and every, I'm talking the right words, the right color, screen, the right color scheme, um, the right presentation on the gospel tract and on our church signs and brochures and things like that to get people's attention, to be able to get them to say, because you don't believe. That's it. So I told that fellow yesterday out in the parking lot. I said, the, the truth about the gospel and how to get to heaven would, would really surprise you if, if you knew. I said, do you want to know? Yeah. I said, do you want to know what God requires for you to get to heaven? What? Believe. Believe on the name of the Son of God. Believe, believe, believe. Believe and only believe. It is Jesus plus nothing. Jesus and, and, and the, uh, every other religion will tell you something different. People who masquerade as Christians, they even believe a lie. You may say, and the world may say, how cocky do you have to be? How arrogant or prideful do you have to be to think that you're the only ones that have the truth? Well, what does that mean, we're the only ones? I don't think um, uh, just because we're independent Baptists that the, the truth is only to us. I think there are some... Um, Non-denominationals, I think there are some Southern Baptists, I think there are some, I think there's some other denominations out there. They've got the gospel. They're screwed up on just about everything else, but they got the gospel. You say, how can that be? I, I don't know. I think because if I think if you have the gospel right, eventually you'll start getting everything else right in line. If you're if you're reading the same Bible I'm reading, but God has let people come to the knowledge of repentance to get to come to the truth that Jesus Christ, but what happens is, is the devil slips in these places and says it's Jesus plus. It's Jesus plus. It can't possibly be Jesus plus. It can't be. And, and I know I've, 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 um, I've, I've used this argument so many times. I've used this fact so many times. But if it's Jesus plus anything, then Jesus is a liar. If it's Jesus plus anything, then Jesus is a liar. Because the thief on the cross died with only Jesus. Amen. He died with only Jesus. He didn't die with Jesus in baptism. He didn't die with Jesus in good works. He didn't die with Jesus in, in um, uh, the rosary. He didn't die with Jesus in uh, uh, confessing his sins at a confessional booth. He didn't die with Jesus in the holy water. He didn't die with Jesus in uh, uh, working in a ministry. He didn't die with Jesus and um, am I my brother's keeper ministries. He didn't die with Jesus printing tracts. He didn't die with Jesus doing anything good. He died on the cross for his sins. He was punished as a thief. And just hours earlier, he was cursing Jesus, and then he turned to Jesus and said, remember me, would you remember me when, we come, when you go into paradise? And he said, today thou shalt be with me, or when you go into your kingdom, and he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, today. It's Jesus plus nothing. So don't let anybody ever come along and tell you it's Jesus plus anything. Don't let you, you, don't let you change your own mind. It can't be that it can't possibly that be that easy. It, it absolutely was that easy. Because Jesus knows how weak we are. He knows how frail we are. He knows how short we come of the glory of God. And Jesus said, um, what was that song? He came, he reached way down for me. Jesus reached way down for me. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Well, when it came to salvation, the only way I could draw nigh to God was by getting covered in the blood. The only way I could draw nigh to God and even approach the throne of God was if he saw the blood and his wrath was able to pass over me. Draw nigh to God by good works? No, your good works don't do anything for salvation. Draw nigh to God by joining a church? That doesn't do anything for salvation. Repentance is a change of what made you lost. Change from what made you lost and repent to what will make you saved. Well, what makes a man saved? Belief. What makes a man lost? Unbelief. Because how? 
Well, I don't believe it says it because the cause of his lostness is because of his unbelief, to put it in modern day terms. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3, 36. What is it that you do not believe that causes you not to see life? Hey, world, I wish we could get the world to see their lostness. I wish, I, I think that every, every, every Christian, we, we've got to take this gospel message incredibly seriously. Uh, uh, incredibly serious to just soak our souls in it, to bathe ourselves in it, and then to tell the world, um, I, I officiated an event for some uh, folks yesterday. I did a wedding for some folks, and um, uh, they're believers, uh, passive believers, um, uh, large Catholic influence. Um, but uh, I wasn't there for everyone there. I was there for the bride and groom, and I met with them individually and made sure that they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I'm not doing weddings for unsaved people. And um, as I sat there waiting to, they were taking pictures, and I was waiting to sign the marriage certificate. And uh, as I was sitting there, I just kind of looked around and uh, it just dawned on me. Some of these people are going to hell. They're having a good time right now. Smiling, laughing, playing, eating, playing with the kids. It's a good time. But I just, I just looked around. Some of them are going to hell. A whole bunch of them, I'm sure. And I just kind of looked at them and I'm like, Lord, do I stand up on a chair right now and start preaching? Like, They'll, they'll ask me, I'll be kicked out. They'll ask me to leave. That guy went from so normal to a weirdo real quick. And I just thought to myself, these people are, some, a bunch of these people are going to hell. They're going to hell. As I drive up and down the interstates of our country, delivering different goods and products and whatnot, uh, and I can see out on the, the massive waves of traffic going and coming, and amongst me, I think, a lot of these people are on a highway to hell. They're on their way to hell. What can we do to get them to believe? What do we do to get people to stop believing untruths and turn to the truth? What is it that a lot of people do not believe that causes them, the Bible says, to not see life? The Bible says it's that they do not believe on the sun. If you believe on the Son, you shall see life. But if you do not believe on the Son, you will not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on them. The wrath of God abides on them. Now, folks, let me say this as a, 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 um, a quick pit stop. As you're a Christian and you're saved and you're trying to win souls, don't look out of the world and see all the stuff they have and the shiny toys that they have and the big houses that they have and their smiles and their vacations and think that they're living a great life and somehow they're blessed and you're not. The Bible says that the wrath of God abides on them. Now, if you take God for his word, you just nail it down, believe it, accept it for what it is. Don't be jealous of the world because the wrath of God is abiding on them. Since then, according to the word of God, not believing on the Son condemns a person or makes him lost, and in doing so brings the wrath of God. So what must you do then? Hey, if you're going to yawn, close your mouth, okay? Just put your hand over your mouth. Do some jumping jacks, some push-ups. You know what? You come up here and preach. It'll wake you up. No? You don't want to do that? Okay. So what must you do then to be saved? You have to repent of the thing that makes you lost. Maybe a neat way to maybe go soul winning. Hey, do you know what you have to do to be saved and go to heaven? Most people are going to say no. I mean, I'm even saying you have to pose it that way. It's very simple then. It's very simple. It just clicks in people's mind. Sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's not what you say, it's how it's phrased, how it's said. How do you, how do you say it? Um, uh, uh, many people say that. Look, I... 
no offense, but, <laughs> and then they say something offensive. Uh, but if we were to oppose that question and then give people the answer, here's the answer to your question. If you don't, if, you, if, if you're lost, how do you get found? By believing. By believing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What is it that you must change your mind about in order to be saved? You must repent of the thing that makes you lost. Change your mind about whatever makes you lost. So you must first change your mind about what you believe on the Son for salvation. Then changes will be that make you saved. You say, what changes? Are your name being written down in the book's Lamb's Book of Life? Changes happen in the fabric of God's eternal, supernatural world that happen in you and for you that you don't even know take place. The Bible says that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He puts his seal on you, his stamp on you, his blood is on you, your, your sin, your life, your, um, uh, your iniquities are under the blood of Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. So what is it you must change about your mind and change your mind about in order to be saved? Number one, you must first change your mind about believing on the Son of God for salvation. This is our, this is our uh, soul-winning class for Sunday night. What do I have to be saved? They come to you, angel, and say, angel, you, I, something different in you? You're going to church all the time? What's this thing? How do, I, how do I go to heaven? You wear a shirt that says, I know I'm going to heaven. They walk up and say, how do you know you're going to heaven? Mr. Arif, how do you know you're going to heaven? You should be able to know how to tell them. Believe on the name of the Son of God. Believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, and he'll save you. It doesn't, there's, there, you don't have to wear a tie. You don't have to be posh. You, there's no formula besides Jesus is the formula. There's one ingredient for salvation. One ingredient. One. And that's repentance. Repentance. They say, repentance. Yes, repentance is the thing that tips the scale, that goes from it opens the door. Repent of what makes you lost. What makes you lost? Not believing. Repent of being lost to believing. And Jesus Christ will say, I will save you. I will come unto you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You have to believe on Jesus for salvation. Believe on Jesus. You must change your mind about your will from not believing on Jesus to believing on Jesus for salvation. That's a big problem in the world today is everyone wants to do their will. Their will. Their will. Uh, we have a, um, uh, the world today, their religion is their will. The way they perceive Jesus, the way they perceive the Bible, the way they want, like I was reading that article this morning. I didn't even finish it. It just got worse. It, was, it all came about me and my and, and how I view religion and how I view tradition and what I want my church to give me and what I want to be a, a part of. No, it's what does Jesus say? Christ died for the church. Christ died for the church. It's not how we want it to be. It's how God designed it to be. And it's a, it's a ministry of people that come together, that worship the word together, that worship the Lord together, that read the word together, that go out and tell the gospel together, that go out and bring in more together, that God grows his church through, that people are blessed by and encouraged by and rebuked by and changed by and our communities are changed by. Now, listen, I'm all for, for, for the gardens that they do and I'm all for campfires and I'm all for stained glass windows. I'm all for that stuff. But stained glass windows windows didn't save me, and vegetables and, and fruits didn't save me, and um, uh, the church building itself didn't save me, and well, we don't, like the, we don't like the build, we want to meet under a tree. Well, trees didn't save me, those things didn't save me, Jesus Christ saved me, and we're going to work this book the way God intended us to work it. We're going to read this book and walk by this book as best that we can, best that we know how, and we're going to get better and better and better at it. I'm not going to try to attract the culture. Are we going to try to have nice tracks? You betcha. You're going to try to have a nice building? Sure. Have uh, rush-free buses in Indiana? Yeah, right. We're going to have uh, 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 nice buses? Of course we are. We're going to have a good program, and, and teachers are going to show up on time. People are going to say amen, and the usher is going to be sharp and, and do what's right, and, and we're going to preach good, solid messages, and we're going to practice in the meeting. Of course, tip-top, decently in an order, first class or no class. But our religion is not our Savior. We have our religion because of our Savior. 
pure religion and undefiled, unspotted from the world, amen? Well, I, don't want a, I don't want a religion that looks like the world. I want a religion that looks like my Savior, and my Savior was kind and caring and passionate and powerful, yet he was nail-scarred. He was kind and patient and powerful, yet he was uh, uh, torn asunder. He was bruised and beaten. He was battered. He had a crown of thorns placed on his head and his beard ripped out of his face and, face and buffeted and falsely accused. Now, I'm not looking for that. I don't want our church to fi- face that kind of opposition. But bless God, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God's about us, let's get the power of God in our lives and in our homes and in our churches and be a mighty marching army toward the gates of heaven or, or as we go toward the gates of heaven. But you best believe the gates of hell are on our way. We will, fight, we will fight against the gates of hell, but God, but God said to Peter, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm not afraid of the gates of hell. I'm not afraid of those. I fear my God more than I do the fear that come from the gates of hell. You say, well, now that's a, the gates of hell, that's a scary statement. Yeah, well, I got pearly gates I'm walking through one day. I'm going to walk on streets of gold by a crystal sea. I'm going to see the face of my Savior, and I'm going to look into the eyes of my God one day, and I hope, I hope I've lived the kind of life, and, or I continue to finish my race, and you finish your race, and we all hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to just do, uh, folks, I'm not in it for me. I'm in it for us. I'm in it for us. There's a cause that is worthy. There's a cause that is greater than myself alone. There's a cause that is greater. And if you get on, if I get on team Jesus and you get on team Jesus and we all get on team Jesus and we all can all do the game plan. Amen. The game plan has been written out. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy ghost, teaching, loving, baptizing, doing what's right by the book. So hang this culturally relevant church. I like stuff. I like nice stuff just like anybody else. But bless God, I think if we put God first, the nice stuff will come along. And hang the nice stuff. The influence will come along. The power of God will come along. The the apostles, they didn't have some million dollar building to meet in. They met in houses and they met with each other and they went out into the markets and I'm sure they had fields that they met out and said, hey, we're coming over to Sally's today. We're going over to John's today. We're meeting over at Paul's today. And man, they grew by 3,000 in a day. They better have had multiple places to meet. If we ran 3,000, we would need a multi-facility, a multi-facility campus. If we ran 3,000, you better believe it. But if we didn't have that campus, and we had a guy who owned 10 acres and a person who owned three acres and somebody, around, and we're like, hey, look, we're going to have, um, you know, we're going to split the church up, okay? We're going to have a church split tonight. Uh, and you guys go meet over on the south side, and you guys go meet over on the north side, and you guys over there on the west side meet over there, and you on the west side. And we had elders and deacons in your church. And, man, they did the best with what they had. But bless God, we're Christians living in America. We can do great things for God. We have a God who can. Do we have a people who will? We have a God who can. Do we have people who will? I want to be willing. I want to be willing. And in many cases, I am. And I know that you are. But folks, we can't just sit around and wait for God to get people saved. We go do the sowing. God does the sending. There's songs that we sing. So send I you. So send I you. And I know it's about the Lord coming from heaven and going to the cross, but it's the same message for you and I tonight. So send God. God sends us out into the harvest to reap of the harvest. Folks, payday someday. God's going to give us what our due is, but let's be faithful to the end. But we can't be faithful if we're faltering on, do we really know the gospel? Do we really know the gospel? Uh, People go to where they know experts are. You know, you ever go to the doctor and you, and you see the doctor and the doctor says, hmm, eh, I can't figure it out. I'm going to send you to an expert. You're like, why don't you just send me there in the first place? You know, just send me there in the first place. Uh, uh, but uh, people go to where they know an, where experts are. Folks, let's become experts on the gospel. Experts on the gospel. Experts on it. Um, I'd like to be an, uh, an expert church builder one day. I'd like to be an expert in administration. I'd like to be an expert in all these different things. But first and foremost, I must be an expert on the gospel, preaching the gospel to the lost, preaching it to the lost. God will tool our church. God will 
retool our church. God will make us and give us all that we need. Nobody knock, uh, um, uh, we knock on doors and God sends somebody from uh, the Philippines. We knock on doors and God sends somebody, hey, we've just moved up here from Georgia and we're looking for an independent Baptist church to go to. And um, so happens that I've got a, uh, I drive a, I drove a church bus down there, but you know, the Lord moved us up here and, and, and hey, they drive a church bus. They sing in the choir. They plug in as ushers and, and uh, 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 Sunday school teachers and, and hey, amen, soul winners. They just show up and say, how can we get involved? But why? Because God sent them here. God sends soldiers to where they are needed. Well, if we're not fighting, we're, I mean, reinforcements, reinforcements are needed when there's a battle raging and the enemy kind of is starting to outnumber the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the allies there, and we're suffering and we need reinforcements, but the, that, that remnant there's got to be fighting. That remnant there's got to be shooting their guns and, and swinging their fists and firing their cannons, and they've got to be engaged in the, in the fight. And the best way that Three Rivers can, can uh, uh, get engaged in the fight again is by becoming expert soul winners. And you say, oh, i got to be an expert soul winner to go? No, no. Be a novice, be a nobody, but you can't be an expert if you don't start take that first step as a novice. You can't take, you can't be an expert. You can't be, man, bit, get bit by the bug, amen. You can't get bit by the soul winning bug until you you get around and you start getting out there and getting after it. You can't really know the joy of leading somebody to Christ until you get out there to do it. Nobody's ever an expert until they are first a, a, a rookie, a veteran and a rookie. So you must do. What must you do then to be saved? What must we tell people to be saved? We have to tell them or express to them repentance of what makes you lost. Repent of what made you lost. If we put it in these words, we would say, if you want to get saved, you have to change your mind about whatever makes you lost. And they go, well, what makes me lost? Not believing on the Son of God. Not believing on the Son of God. So, uh, I have many other things here, but um, I'll, I'll stop with this. So you have to change from not believing that Jesus is your only hope for heaven to believing that Jesus is your only hope for heaven. Jesus only. Jesus only. Jesus only. Maybe that's what we ought to put on the front of some, some uh, tracks that we print. It's Jesus only. Jesus only. Or Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus, that'll really make some of these folks mad. Jesus plus nothing. Uh, uh, man, it... I was going to say something really corny, like, man, that burns my biscuits. Um, uh, it, it makes me angry. Why, why do all these people want to add stuff to Jesus? Is Jesus not enough? Is Jesus not enough for you that you're so special that you've got to bring something to the table? You're not special. You aren't so special that you bring something to the table besides repentance for salvation. You can bring nothing Hey, Lord, I, I, I put on a robe, and I came out in front of a congregation, and I got dunked under water, or I got poured on or sprinkled. Big whoop. You know where that water came from, right? Folks, I don't care if it came from Ice Mountain or Coligan or Aquafina. I don't care if it's a, if it, if it's a baptism full of, um, uh, what's that, Japanese water? Uh, what? Yeah, Fiji. I don't care if it's a baptismal full of Fiji water. I don't care where it came from. I don't care if it's ice that melted off of glaciers and we filled our baptismal with it. It didn't do anything for you. Besides make a symbol buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. We can't say that if you haven't believed on the name of Jesus Christ. I can't baptize you. It's believe then baptism. Belief, a baptism always comes after believing. Believe, then get baptized. Believe. Believe. Uh, 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 all these people want to add stuff to Jesus, add stuff to Jesus. Jesus is enough. He always has been, and he always will be. And I'll tell you, anybody that ever listens to this, if you're involved in any kind of uh, church or ministry or religion that says Jesus plus, get out of it. Get out of it. They're preaching heresy. It's Jesus and Jesus only. And a lot of people are led astray is because they don't ever develop a relationship with this in the first place. This, and not one like this, but this, the King James Bible. The King James Bible. 
the truth inside and out. So you must change from not believing that Jesus is your only hope to believing that Jesus is your only hope. In order to be saved, you must undo whatever you did to be lost. Undo whatever you did to be lost. What do you do to go to hell? You do not believe on the only begotten Son of God, who is Jesus Christ. What do you do in order to have eternal life? Believe on the Son of God, and thou shalt be saved. The Bible says in John 5, 40, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Ye will not come to me. What? What? And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. What keeps people from having eternal life? Not coming to Jesus keeps people from having eternal life and abundant life, the Bible says in John 10, 10. While living here on earth, not coming to Jesus for salvation results in an eternity. I, I, I can't wrap my mind around that. An eternity in hell. So if a person does not come to Jesus, if a person will not go to Jesus, not repent, then he will go to hell for eternity. Now, we don't want that. If you don't care, then you don't love people the way that we're commanded to love people. The Bible says love our neighbor as ourselves. Of course, love the brethren. But there has to become, there, there's a natural affection for a Christian to have love for people to not want to die and go to hell. But I will tell you that natural affection can become cold. The Bible says in the latter days, in the end days, people won't have natural affection anymore. Well, it doesn't say all people, but most people, they're not going to have natural affection. Let it not be said about Three Years Baptist Church that we lost an affection to see people saved. We, 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 we kept caring about our neighbor. Uh, love God and love our neighbor as ourself. And if we will be concerned about people and give them the gospel, Give them fruit, give them vegetables, go admire the nice stained glass together and um, uh, sit around fire pits together. Do all those things. That's all great. I'm all for that. But what kind of, what kind of people would we be if we had opportunities to witness to people and we didn't do it? Do yourself a favor. Fast forward out into the future and see yourself at the great white throne judgment. You say, well, we won't be at the great white throne judgment. We may be there as witnesses. I may be called to the witness stand. What if, what if somebody is standing there that I had the opportunity to tell and I did not tell and they are bound hand and foot and cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever and they'll never get out. And they scream at me and curse at me and tell me, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you say anything to me? Why? Can we really in our hearts say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? I'm not. I, I'm not ashamed of my Christ. Then if we're not ashamed of Christ, we would talk about him. We talk about the things and the people that we're proud of, right? Talk about our accomplishments that we're proud of. Talk about people that we're proud of. Look, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm proud of my dad. I'm proud of my mom. Um, my mom, over longevity, because of all the, the things as the weaker vessel, as the scripture says, the things that she's been through, the battles that she's fought, as my dad's been sick these a decade. And how, you know how many times she quit? Like a million. <laughs> but she's still here. She's still here. Uh, because she didn't, she didn't mean it. She meant it, but she didn't really, you know what I mean? You say things that you're like, I'm not. but I'm proud of my mom. I'm, I'm proud of my dad. And I told him yesterday, I was proud of him. He had a bunch of dental work done, still has to have more done, but to reverse what has been done, uh, what has, done, has been done has to heal up. Um, and my dad, he's a, I don't mean this in a, in a, in a sinful way, but he's a, he's a prideful guy. He's got some self-pride. And all, that, all those teeth that have to be fixed and what do they call them, partials? Partials and things. He's got some, um, 
some self-pride, you know, an image to uphold. And he went out soul winning yesterday. He went out visiting yesterday. He stood up in front of the church. I didn't think he'd even come to church today. And he did. I was like, wow. Man, I'm, I'm proud of him. I, when my, 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 Lucas in Houston, they helped me move 99, 98% of everything when we moved. I had a couple of guys show up and help me move um, the refrigerator and the freezer. They helped me move every box, the couches, the furniture, the stove, the oven, uh, the washer, the dryer. And we didn't just move it once. We, we moved it twice and three times. Out of the house and onto the truck and out of the truck and into the building. And, oh, it can't go there. It's got to go there. And all, I'm, I'm talking seven people live in that house. And those guys, I'm proud of them. Incredibly proud of them. Uh, so what, what am I saying? I'm saying we talk about the people and we give props and we, we kind of gush over the things that make us happy, the accomplishments that we go. Jesus is my greatest accomplishment. You say, you didn't accomplish that. Sure, I did. And so did you. Because I believed on him. I believed on him. Now, that might be the wrong word to use. He, he's accomplishing me, amen. Because, um, uh, boy, am, 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 I a, am I a something to deal with? Uh, Jesus is accomplishing me. But I, I, the greatest thing that I ever did was trust Christ. The greatest one I've ever known was Jesus Christ. The one who saved me from eternal damnation and condemnation and the wrath of God was Jesus Christ. And not only did he save me and be like, okay, I saved you, now go on your way. He saved me and he is saving me and he's going to save me. Now that's a whole other thing to get into. But I'm saved. He saved me. I, daily, he's, I am saved. And one day he's going to save me out of this world, amen. He's going to save me out of here and redeem me and redeem my body, I mean, and give me a glorified body and I'll stand before my Savior and I'll stand before my God never ever to sin again. But I want to be able to do it confidently and, and, and I don't want to stand before the, the Lord ashamed. Not ashamed of him, but ashamed that I was ashamed. I... I feel sorry for a lot of people who are living that way now who they may not have enough time to get right with God. They may not have enough time to start living for God. And when they stand before the Lord and they look into the eyes of Jesus and they see the scarred hands and the scarred brow and the scarred feet and the wounded or the scarred side of Jesus and we see him and we look upon our Savior first of all, I think immediately if we did not try to live for him, we'll feel regret I know that we'll be filled with regret and say, oh, why didn't I? Why didn't I? Folks, let's not let not that be us. Let's get a hold of the gospel and tell others the gospel. Tell others. Because if they reject you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Savior. They're rejecting Jesus. Soul winning isn't personal for you. It's personal for them and for the Savior. You're just a representative. You're just a representative. So the gospel, I know that y'all are saved. Raise your hand if you were born, you know Jesus, you asked Jesus, yeah, everybody in here. Good, good, good. Put your hands down. Okay, so you know you're saved. But that repentance issue, I think next week it'll be finished. Um, uh, but repentance, wasn't that so easy to understand? Repent from the thing that made you lost. What made you lost? Not believing. John 3, 18. John 3, 36. What makes you lost? What, John, uh, what was it? I think it's 50. 3, verse 50. Uh, I'll look later. Uh, but John chapter 3. I, I love the book of John. Believe, 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 believe not, believe not. It, it's so cut and dry. It's so easy to understand. Believe. We could have tracts printed just out of John. The John tract. Uh, we hand away the, the, the books of John. I love that we do that. The books of John, hand them out to people. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it, salvation is not some hard formula to understand. How, well, how, did you, how did you get saved? Well, I believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and I asked him to forgive my sins and save me. Ta-da! You just relay that message. All you're doing is relaying it. Let's venture out to do that. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, tonight. I thank you for the gospel message. And Lord, uh, the, God, the Bible says it's the free gift. Now, Lord, we know it wasn't free. It had to be paid for. The sin debt had to be paid. It's free to me. It was free to me. It's free to everyone who who take of it. But somebody had to pay the debt. Jesus paid that debt. Lord, I. It's hard for me to imagine in my mind what the scene must have been as they took Jesus captive. They put him on trial. And then. Everything broke loose as they buffeted Jesus. They spit on him. They mocked him over and over and over again. And then they placed a crown of thorns upon his head that sunk down into his brow. And blood began to gush from his head from every point. And then they strung him up, I believe, with his hands over his head and his feet maybe barely touching the ground as they took that kite of nine tails and beat him and beat him and beat him. 39 times, Isaiah prophesied that he, he didn't even look like a man when they were done with him. And then Lord had just piled on from there. Then they said, here's your cross. Pick it up and carry it up that hill. And as the blood began to coagulate and dry and scab on his skin, but other parts wouldn't heal and because things were nicked and cut and he was bleeding out as he tried to struggle up that hill. And then they nailed him to it, hung him on it, and there he died. That sin debt was paid. He went through all that for me, who is not worthy. He went through all that for the world who is not worthy. Our Heavenly Father, we have a message that is of the utmost importance. I'd ask that you would help us to honor it, to handle it with the urgency that it needs to be handled. And telling people the gospel, sharing Jesus with people, that he loves them, will forgive him if all they would do is repent and change their mind from the thing that made them lost, which was not believing, and repent to believe and believe on the name of the Son of God. Lord, thank you for making it so simple for broken, weak people like us. Lord, I'd ask that you would give us an opportunity um, let our path cross the path of somebody who wants to be saved. And then help us to be aware, our uh, spiritual alert, our antenna to be up, looking, uh, and being on the lookout for people. Oh, Lord, you, you'll go with us. You said you would. Lord, I'd ask that you'd keep us safe this week as we travel and uh, this Christmas season. Help us to be thankful and of a giving spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We are dismissed.